a few other parts, important parts, um, and those are related to uh, what we call, <clears throat> sorry, my screen wasn't popping here, parametric relationships. And these parametric relationships allow the software to coordinate and manage changes as they occur. So as we make updates to things like, for instance, sheets, um, whether we're changing a schedule, whatever the case may be, all of these fundamental items are coordinating without you having to do anything. It's a very powerful tool. Now, some of the businesses, business issues resolved with Revit, um, design changes and corrections. Uh, when we make those changes in one location, we can be assured that they're going to be reflected throughout the entire project. The next is collaborative design. We're able to work seamlessly in one file through, through something we call work sharing. Now, we're not going to get heavy into work sharing in this presentation, but it is an important tool in allowing all of our staff to work on one file as opposed to having to read only and, and copy multiple files into one location. We're also able to do things like standardize our company standards very easily. The template program inside of Revit is seamless and it's integrated very nicely throughout our file directories. So it's very easy for us to become you know, very standardized in the way we operate throughout the interface. We're also able to integrate design and drafting into one program. So no longer are we having to work in a program like SketchUp and then figure out how to translate it into basic AutoCAD. With Revit, we're able to do it all in one place. Finally, we can connect annotations to designs. So we're able to make sure that not only when we, for instance, draw a callout symbol, is that callout symbol uh, uh, reflecting to a sheet, we're able to make sure that that callout symbol is actually reflecting or working with the actual design elements that it's relating to. And we'll talk about that briefly as we go through the program. Now let's go ahead and just uh, wrap up here with a, a quick little discussion about our support solutions here at Sisterling Systems. One thing I want to point out is a, a, a promotion that we're running right now which is one free of gold support with each seat of software purchased. So with every seat of uh, uh, software that your office purchase, purchases, you receive gold support. And what that means is you get a certified professional like myself that you can do constant phone and email support with. We also provide virtual on-site support. We'll actually VPN into your machine and be able to provide either training or on uh, sort of on-screen demonstration of how a, a particular issue might be resolved. Another big event that we have coming up is we have Lynn Allen coming into town. If you don't know who Lynn Allen is, I, I encourage you to take a look at her blog. She's uh, probably uh, worked with over 30,000 uh, different Autodesk uh, uh, suppliers and uh, um, uh, support providers out there. She is the end-all, be-all when it comes to AutoCAD, and she knows it all. Um, she's a great asset to us, and we're very excited to have her coming on February 16th. So look forward to upcoming event invites. Um, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact our staff regarding this upcoming event. Um, if you have any uh, uh, questions, uh, don't hesitate to uh, contact Brandon Taylor, who's uh, our account manager. You'll see his contact information up here. Um, you'll also see it, unfortunately, it says my name, but it's Chad Studer. You're also welcome to contact him. He's the vice president of our services. You'll see that his uh, in, or, uh, info for uh, his email address is located on here as well. Um, don't worry if you're not catching all this. Uh, we'll make sure to get it out to you uh, through our, uh, our fan out emails. Also, as I said, look for our next Wednesday's January 11th Intro to Family Creation presentation. That is from 2 to 3.30. Uh, also following that is a January 16th presentation, and that is editing family creation. So we're actually going to talk about how we edit families that we pull off websites like Revit City. And then finally, on uh, January 25th, we have a top 10 tips and tricks. Um, really great tools that thing, uh, of things people aren't commonly um, aware of, uh, one of which we'll talk about is uh, design options, talk about phasing a little bit, uh, things that are, are great assets to our staff, uh, are great assets to our companies, but maybe we don't get exposed to very often. Uh, now, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and open up the Revit Architecture Program. I'm going to, again, just ask if anyone has any last-minute questions or wants to chat an item uh, maybe you're having a, a difficulty seeing my screen or my voice uh, isn't coming across very clear. Please don't hesitate to chat there if you have a quick question. Doesn't appear that we have any. 
So I am going to go ahead and roll right into our Revit architecture demonstration. Uh, what I have prompted here is Autodesk Revit Architecture 2012. Um, what we see right now is our recent files window on screen. And this is our startup window. So whenever we start up Revit, this is what we're going to see. There are three parts to this. The first is our project location. This is how we go ahead and start a new project. The next are family creations. So we're able to build families from this portion of the project. And finally, we have our resource center. Resource Center is actually a new addition to the Autodesk family. It's a great tool that's become a part of all of the Autodesk applications. And what's fantastic about it is it allows us to access community boards, chat sites, help data, anything you can think that you might be interested in finding support on can oftentimes be find, found in this Resource Center. So it's a great asset to you and your staff. Now in addition to that, we also have our Revit Start window, which is right up here in our upper left-hand corner. It allows us to start, create new projects, open existing files. You name it, we can pretty much do it from this window. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and simply start a new project. So I'm going to go ahead and hit the New button. And once I do that, I'm going to have the Revit interface prompt for me. A quick what's new picks and clicks, um, or not what's new, but a top ten tricks that a lot of people aren't familiar with, uh, is right now you'll notice that I have a... Uh, uh, a black screen on, on, on display. Uh, many people are accustomed to seeing the white screen. Um, quick little uh, uh, tutorial, if you go to the options menu under graphics, you're able to actually invert your background color from white or black. So if you're interested in, in having a black background versus a white background, again, you can go up to your R symbol in the upper left-hand corner, find your options palette button. You'll notice that under where it says graphics, you're able to go ahead and check the box that says invert background color. That allows you to change from black background to a white background. Now there's a few different parts and pieces to the interface. Way at the top of the screen is the ribbon. And for those of you guys that have not seen the ribbon yet, it uh, came to Reddit, or came to Autodesk actually in 2009. Uh, AutoCAD actually was the first recipient of the ribbon. Um, it got it as sort of a trial basis in 2009. And it, uh, it got fully exposed to it in 2010 when the Revit program took it on. And it has maintained the ribbon now uh, since 2010 and into 2012. Uh, it's certainly not going anywhere. It's a, a nice addition to the Revit program. Uh, many older uh, Revit users are, are definitely becoming accustomed to using it now. And it is a welcome uh, a welcome change um, from past renditions of the program. Um, what's great about the ribbon are, are some of the functionalities that you have with the panels and tabs. And we'll talk about what some of those are here in just a few moments. Um, the first thing I want to point out, though, uh, are these tabs at the very top of the screen. You notice that we have various tabs that we can flip through. Uh, the first tab that I'm going to talk about is the Home tab. And the Home tab is where we hold all of our modeling components, such as walls, doors, windows. Uh, we're able to do things such as roofs, floors, ceiling systems, or railings, staircases, you name it. Most of our modeling components are going to be found right here on the Home tab. The next tab we have is the Insert tab, and the Insert tab has things such as linking files. We're able to bring in our CAD documentation. Uh, we're able to import point clouds, which is actually a new feature in 2012. We can manage links. Um, we can import images. And we can also load families. The next thing we have is our Annotation tab, and our Annotation tab has all of our uh, dimensions, our leader lines, uh, things like text, hatch patterns. Um, everything that you could think of that would go into developing construction documentation is oftentimes found on the annotation tab. The next addition is our analyze tab, which actually is another new feature that was brought to us in 2012. And it has energy analysis uh, tools built into it that allow us to toggle energy settings, look at results and comparisons that we might find in the program. Really a great asset for those of you that are looking to do things like, for instance, shadow studies, um, or heat, heat loss or heat load, load gains. Next is our structural tab. Our structural tab has everything from placing beams, columns, to structural floors as well as beam systems. We're not going to delve into this too much today, but um, definitely a great asset. Next we have the massing and site tab, which we're actually going to kick today's demonstration off with. Um, we actually are able to build masses, topographic surfaces, um, and, and we'll talk about this briefly in, in just a few moments. 
Finally, we have the Collaborate tab, and the Collaborate tab allows us to do that work sharing tool that I talked about briefly. Um, work sharing is a discussion that we have actually in our introductory Revit architecture training. So for anyone that's interested in learning more about work sharing, uh, don't hesitate to contact Brandon, <coughs> Brandon Taylor to get a little bit more feedback on how we could uh, be an asset in setting up work, uh, work sets and work sharing for your office. The final three tabs that we have here are the View tab, which allows us to manage our views. We'll talk about this quite a bit. Our Manage tab, which allows us to manage the actual project content. And our Modify tab, which allows us to modify information as we create it on screen. The next tab that we have or feature we have is our Properties Palette. This is also actually a newer feature into the Revit Architecture program. Uh, it came last year in the 2011 edition. It's very beneficial and has been very helpful in editing instance properties. And we'll talk about what instance properties are in just a few moments. Next we have what's called the Project Browser, which is down here on the bottom of the screen. See I'm kind of having some circles pop up on screen for it right now. Now that Properties Browser, what it allows us to do is toggle through different views. So whether we want to toggle through a floor plan, an elevation, a section, or a 3D view, we're going to use that Project Browser to do that. What we're seeing in our Project Browser is right here on our main screen. It's our View window. And our view window actually goes ahead and, and hold, is, is what we're pulling up out of our project browser. So all the content we build, all the walls we draw, all the doors and windows we place, we're going to notice prompt right here onto our, um, our, display, our display view. Now every single view, every view that we have in, in project has what we call display properties. And these are these property settings that we see down here at the bottom of the screen. Now every view has its own set of display properties, so we can adjust things like scale, um, our visual styles, shadow settings, all those sorts of things. And we'll talk about more of that briefly as we move through this demonstration later on today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start this presentation uh, by creating a mass. Now before I create a mass, one of the things that I want to do is go ahead and set up my project a little bit. And um, what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be building sort of a, a generic um, office building, um, just, just to kind of get, a, get us uh, introduced to the program. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open up an elevation view to start. Now our views are very important to us. They allow us to view different parts and pieces of the program, but they also have individual portions that make them sort of a... Um, uh, crucial in developing our 3D information. So as an example, when we look at an elevation view, we'll notice that we have some level lines in place. Now these level lines are very important to developing walls as we move through the project. So as an example right now, you'll notice that I have a couple of level lines in place. Now these level lines are very important because the level lines actually relate to one another. So as an example, if I were to double click on a level line, and change, for instance, the height distance of a level line, you'll notice that that level line moves relative to the other level lines that you see on screen. Now I'm going to go ahead and add a few additional level lines. I'm going to go ahead and select this level line we see here, and I'm going to go ahead and create a similar one. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and add an offset property that allows me to just go ahead and place a few additional level lines in. So I've gone ahead and very quickly just added six level lines into my project. Now you'll notice something that's very important is over here in our project browser as I did that, I also added levels in my project browser. So those level lines relate directly to the project browser. You know, as I'm adding those level lines, that information is automatically updating in that view as well. Now next what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and open up one of my floor plans. So I'm going to go ahead and open up level one. And I'm also going to go ahead and open up a 3D view. So I'm going to open up a few different views inside my project. Now on my view tab of my ribbon, I have a little tool here called tile. And what this tile tool allows me to do is actually tile all three of those windows on screen. Now what's great about that is that I'm able to see what's going on in all of these different screens as I work. I'm going to go ahead and open up my floor plan view and I'm going to start by generating a mass. 
Now I'm going to go ahead and select over here that I want to create an in-place mass. And I'm going to go ahead and name my mass office building. Now developing a mass is not complicated. Our starting point is just developing a generic profile that we can work from. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and begin developing that generic profile. I'm not going to go crazy with the size with the size of my structure here. I'm going to keep it sort of simple. You'll notice as I'm doing this that I'm getting little uh, sort of like annotative guides, sort of like what we might see in OSNAP for those or, um, ortho tracking for those of you that are familiar with AutoCAD. Now, once my shape's been developed, I can actually view this in multiple views. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate over to a 3D view just so I can see that structure. Now you notice that right now this just looks like a bunch of lines. And at the moment that's all that it is. If I tab to one of those lines, you'll notice that I have these temporary dimensions. And these temporary dimensions allow me to make changes. So as an example, if I wanted this space right here to be 55 feet, I could very quickly go ahead and make that change. Now I'm going to go ahead and leave this at 50 feet just for our, our discussion. Now if I go ahead and I click that collection of line work, one of the things that I'll notice is up here in my ribbon, I now get a, a little bit different display. I've noticed that the ribbon's kind of changed to this green color. And what this means is I have what's called a contextual tab. And a contextual ribbon tab, basically all that means is when you select a tool, it's giving you all of the different tools, or when you select an object, it's giving you all of the different tools that relate to that particular object. So in this case, as I go through this contextual ribbon, I'll notice there's an option here to create a form. And if I were to select solid form, I'll notice that it actually goes ahead and builds a 3D shape for me. Now for those of you guys that are diehard SketchUp users, I, uh, I definitely uh, uh, know where you come from. I used to love SketchUp. It was a huge part of, of, of my first sort of crack at 3D. Um, this interface is actually not that different from SketchUp. Um, so you may, you may find some things in common with it. If we select a surface, we're able to push and pull that surface, similar to the way we might use the program like SketchUp and other modeling software that's out there. We also in this program have the ability to use these annotative dimensions to make this uh, maybe a little bit more, I don't want to say scientific, but a little bit more um, accurate. So as an example, I could say I want that to be 60 feet. Now there's some other powerful tools available to us in this massing tool that maybe we don't find in other modeling tools. So as an example, let's say that we wanted to edit a point. So let's say from you know, one location we wanted to move one point of the structure. Notice that I can select an actual point on the project and have that one point rotate. Now in addition to that, I can actually pick a edge or a face on any one of the shapes. So notice that I'm able to toggle that shape out as well. Suppose I wanted to create maybe a cantilevered edge. I can also select an edge and I can actually cantilever that particular edge. So notice I'm able to actually use really any of the edges or points that I've developed to create interesting shapes. Now in addition to that, I also can create additional edges. So as an example, if I were to go ahead and select this entire object and go up to my contextual ribbon, I'll notice that I have some options, one of which is to add an edge. So as an example, I could add an edge in this project. I could select that edge, and I could again make an additional modification. I also can add what's called a profile. So as an example, if I select the Profile tool, I could pick a point somewhere on this mass. I'll notice that I can find that profile, and I could adjust that profile edge. So very quickly, I'm able to do a lot of the things that we find in other modeling programs, but maybe a little bit uh, different, maybe a little bit uh, different than way, maybe the way we're accustomed to using the program. Now for our purposes, this generic shape is going to do the job. One last little little tool though I do want to show just on the off chance that you're not convinced entirely by this massing tool 
is that this program really is technically savvy when it comes to massing. As an example, if I wanted to create a torque shape, I could actually go ahead and rotate a face. And notice that very quickly I'm able to go ahead and develop very interesting dynamic shapes. Now, by no means have I given uh, or done justice to all the tools that are available to us in the massing program. However, in our introductory class of our Revit Architecture program, we do delve a little bit deeper into the massing tools and talk about how we can create divided surfaces and also how we can develop dynamic sweeps and other components that go into a technical mass. I'm going to go ahead and for now go ahead and hit finish mass. And we're going to go ahead and move a little bit more into how we turn this mass into an actual structure. Now, if you remember, I have multiple views open. And if I were to go ahead and window tile again, you'll notice that in all three of these views, I'll notice that I can see that object that I've generated. You'll notice that over here in my elevation view, that I'm able to actually see my mass shape. And I'm able to see how it relates to those level lines. I'm going to go ahead and pull that mass shape up to the top of my level line. And next what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and look back at my 3D view. Now in order to turn this into a structure, I'm going to have to begin applying materials to this mass. Now obviously I can see faces that I would want to apply, for instance, a ceiling or a roof, possibly a base floor, and possibly some walls. However, I am missing a key element, and that's a surface to go ahead and start applying all of my floors in. One of the things that's great about Revit is that it's so intuitive. So as an example, if I were to go ahead and click the shape, I'll notice that when I scroll up to my contextual tab, it's telling me maybe you want to think about massing some floors. So I can go ahead and select the Mass Floor tool, and you'll notice I'm prompted with a tool that allows me to check which level lines I want floors to be applied to. I'm going to go ahead and say OK. And you'll notice that I now have some floors in place. Now, by no means is there any material applied to this, nor is there uh, you know, any uh, dimension applied at this point. It's just really a generic surface. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start applying some actual materials to this generic mass that we see. I'm going to navigate up here in the ribbon to the Massing and Site tab. And on the Massing and Site tab, I'm going to notice that I have a few different tools available to me. I'm able to, from this tab, mass curtain systems, roofs, walls, or floors. I'm going to go ahead and start by massing some floors. Now, when I go over to my Type Selector in my Properties panel, I'm able to navigate to some generic floors that I might want to use on this project. I'm going to go ahead and select a floor type. And I'm going to go ahead and start picking various floors that I want to use, or that I want to select. Once I'm done with that, I'm going to go ahead and hit my Create Floor button. And once I do that, you'll notice that if I zoom in just a bit, there's now a material applied and also a thickness available to me for that floor that I just added. Now, in addition to floors, I'm going to go ahead and start adding some walls to this project. I'm going to, again, go to the Massing and Site tab of the ribbon. I'm going to select my wall tool. And I'm going to go ahead and start selecting a generic wall I want to use in this project. Now, one of the things that's important to understand is that by no means am I describing all the tools and steps that go into this. This is somewhat of a detailed process. These are the sort of the stepping stones to how we start to navigate and use the program. Now, you'll notice that I left one of the walls blank. And with this last wall, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and select a different wall style. I'm going to select a curtain wall style. And again, I'll select that end wall. And you'll notice that I get a different window type that I'm able to work with. I'm going to round this massing demonstration out by applying a roof to my structure. I'm going to go ahead and select a roof type. And I'll go ahead and pick the top roof structure, and I'll say Create Roof. So you'll notice very quickly I was able to develop a pretty generic structure. And nothing all that special about it, just sort of generic. We're going to see if we can't make it a little bit uh, you know, more technically detailed than this. I'm going to go ahead and switch to a first floor plan. 
And from my first floor plan, I'm going to go ahead and just start placing in some walls, doors, windows, some different components that are going to be important to the way that I develop information on screen. I'm going to start by switching to the Home tab of the ribbon. And from the Home tab of the ribbon, I'm going to go ahead and select the Wall Tool. And I'm going to go browse and find an interior wall type. One thing I want you to notice is that right now this program looks a little cartoony, right? We're not seeing a whole lot of detail here. In fact, it just looks like a lot of thick lines on screen. I do have some ways to toggle that. In fact, on the View tab of the ribbon, I have a little tool here called Thin Lines. And what this Thin Lines tool does is it actually thins the lines out so I don't see the thick line weights that are on screen. Now, in addition to that, down at the bottom of my screen in my display properties, I have a setting down here that allows me to toggle the display filters. So as an example, if I wanted to view this in a bit more detail, I could select Fine. You will notice I'll start to see the materials that exist within the walls that I've been generating. Again, I'm going to use the Wall tool. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start drawing some walls into my structure. Now you'll notice as I draw these walls, they start to automatically clean up with one another. So regardless of where I place them, you'll notice that there's cleanups occurring. This is a really great tool and feature inside the Revit program that we're able to create these quick cleanups. Very quickly, I'm going to go ahead and just generate a few walls in my structure. And then from there, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and start placing in some doors and windows. Now, the wall tools are very easy to use. It's really as simple as drawing lines in other programs. And there's also some great editing tools available to us that allow us to make modifications. So as an example, we have tools such as the split tool, which allow us to create splits in our walls. And from those splits, we're able to actually go ahead and pull certain portions of the wall back. Notice that it very easily cleans that data up for me. In addition to that, we also have trim tools that allow us to very easily clean up those features. And we have extend tools that allow us to very quickly go ahead and clean up the way that those lines clean up with one another. We also have copying features, similar to AutoCAD, that allow us to go ahead and copy certain elements. So let's say we wanted to copy that wall in a couple locations. And we also have tools that allow us to do things like, for instance, mirroring. So as an example, if I wanted to go ahead and mirror this wall across, for instance, a hall, I could do that very quickly. Use my toggles to, to get this to kind of fit in the window the way I want it to. Now we also have some content available that allows us to go ahead and place in, for instance, things like doors and windows. Now one of the things that's important when you're starting to understand how the Revit program works is that we use what we call families in the Revit architecture software. Now a lot of people get confused by what the, this idea of families are. And families are really all the nuts and bolts that go into Revit architecture. We have two different types of families. We have what we call system families and we have component families. Now, system families are families that reside actually in the project. So as an example, something like a wall or a floor or a roof would be a system family. And those are families that are actually developed natively in the project file. Now, we also have component families, which are similar to things like, for instance, doors, window, or furniture. These are items that are actually developed in family creation modes. And we'll actually be demonstrating this again next Wednesday, January 11th at 2 o'clock. Now, those family creation tools allow us to go ahead and build things like, for instance, custom doors, custom windows. We can also develop uh, lighting fixtures. You name it, we can really build it in those family creation modes. Now, Revit comes stock with a lot of different components. And as an example, if I select the door tool, I notice that there's some generic doors that I can work with. Now, there's also additional doors that come along with the Revit program, and those are loaded in through our Imperial Library. And you'll notice right now that our Imperial Library has some really great features available to it. And as an example, if I were to go ahead and select the Doors tool, I would notice that I could see all the different doors that are available to me. 
For those of you guys using Windows 7, a great feature, and this is not an Autodesk feature, this is Windows 7 in general. If you hit the control key and you actually wheel forward with your mouse, what it allows you to do is get a little icon of any of the content that's available to you. So just by holding the control key and wheeling in just slightly, I can actually see all the doors that are available to me. And as an example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just grab a couple doors that I might want. I'm going to go ahead and select the single glass door because I think I might want to use that. Um, and you know what, I'll also select the double. I think I have a double, um, a double glass door in here as well. I'm just going to go ahead and select those two and I'm going to open them up in the project. Now what I'm going to do once these load themselves into the project is I'm just going to go ahead and place them. And placing these doors is really quite simple. Just go ahead and find your location. You'll actually notice that you have these little temporary dimension guides, and they take a pretty good stab at making sure everything's centered. You'll notice that it also tags that door as I place it, which is a very powerful tool that we'll talk about a little bit in just a few moments when we get into annotations. Now when we select something like a door, we'll notice that there's different tools available to us. We actually have these little flip tools that are available that are very easy to maybe flip on either side of the door that we might want it to go. For those of you guys that are looking to use the program very quickly, we can also use the space bar, which is also a flip tool available to us. So there are some hotkeys available in the program. Now very quickly, I'm just going to go ahead and plop a couple doors in here that we can use for today's demonstration. Now in addition to doors, I might also want to go ahead and place some windows into this project. So what I'm going to do is, um, once I've got all my doors in place here, I'm just going to go ahead and start placing in some windows. Again, notice that as I'm placing these, that it's automatically allowing me to, to use those toggle features that I talked about briefly. And it's also tagging all this information. One thing to remember is you don't need to get too concerned necessarily about um, sort of positioning as you preliminarily put or as you um, begin to navigate and put these doors in. We can always come back in and use these temporary dimension tools that we have to adjust the relationship the door has to the nearest wall. I'm going to go ahead and from the Home tab select my Window tool. And I'm going to very quickly go ahead and just drag, drop, drag and drop some windows into my screen. Um, just going to just plop a couple in here uh, as quickly as I possibly can. Sorry for the little bit of delay here. Now, you'll notice that I'm doing this on this first floor right now, which is great. You know, I'm getting this information uh, to show up on screen the way I'd want it to. Um, and I'm also going to go ahead and try to translate this data onto my corresponding floors. So I'm just going to go ahead and finish up by just plopping a couple more windows here. And then I'm going to go ahead and switch to a 3D view. So you'll notice very quickly that, you know, just in a few moments here, I was able to go ahead and place in some windows and some doors into my project. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and try to add these windows to the entire structure. So I'm going to go ahead and select everything I see on screen here. And I'm going to use my filter tool to actually go ahead and just select the windows that I have on screen. So notice I've just selected the windows. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy these windows to my clipboard. And once I've copied them to my clipboard, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to paste them to the levels that I want them to be on. So let's say I wanted these windows to be on level 2, level 3, level 4, level 5, and we won't put them on level 6 because that's our rooftop. By simply saying OK, it's going to go ahead and think for just a few seconds. And notice it goes ahead and places all those windows up to our corresponding floors. Now, one thing I like to point out at this point is our massing tool. Now, a lot of people ask at this point is, well, great, you know, you're able to, to use that mass and, and very quickly place some walls, throw on a couple doors, put a roof in, sure, it looks great, awesome job. But, <clears throat> you know, I could have done that just as easily by starting right from the get-go and using the wall tools. 
Well, one of the things that's nice about our massing feature is that let's say that a change happened or a client changed their mind, which I know rarely happens. A little bit of sarcasm. But uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just tab to that mass. I'm going to go ahead and select that mass. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go ahead and change it a little bit. I'm not going to be, um, be overly uh, accurate with it. I'm just going to say that the client got a little bit more money and wanted to make, make the structure just a hair bigger in two directions, right? Just wanted to make it a little bit bigger. Well, notice that my mass has grown now, but my shape hasn't, right? My, my structure hasn't. If I were to select that mass, if I just go ahead and pick that mass, you notice that I have a feature up here called Related Hosts. And if I select that feature, it selects all of the content that I've created based on that mass. And it now provides me with an option to update to face. And if I select that, what it does is it actually goes ahead and it updates all of my faces to coordinate with the actual massing that I had done. So you'll notice that it actually went ahead and grew the structure and you know, subsequently made, uh, made everything a bit bigger. Now obviously I probably need to go back in here and add a few windows, but you know, for, a, for a schematic development, it was able to do a pretty good job for me. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn my mass off because I'm not overly concerned with seeing it anymore. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, and make sure my mass is turned off. And I'm going to go ahead and switch back to my first floor. And let's just talk a little bit briefly about our first floor. Um, just because I know this data hasn't found its way up to my corresponding levels, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm just going to copy some information up that I know didn't make its way up to the other levels. I'm just going to copy this data up just so that when we create sections a little bit later on, we've got a little bit more, uh, more data to work with. Now, one of the things that I get asked a lot about is, um, uh, is developing you know, some, some cool schematic data that we can very quickly display to clientele. So as an example, let's say that we wanted to very quickly go ahead and, um, and just do a quick little, um, you know, I, don't, I don't know, let's say we wanted to do a, uh, uh, a color chart you know, as an example. Let's just say we wanted to have an idea of our, our room area. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my Home tab. And from my Home tab, I'm going to select the Room tool that I have available to me. Now with the Room tool, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start tagging this. Now you'll notice that as I tag these, that is actually telling me the area of that particular space, which is great. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that it's, it's giving me an idea of what that area is and uh, it's, it's hopefully going to be beneficial to the project. Now, I'm going to plop a few more of these guys in here, and I'm also going to go ahead and, and try to add some names in. I'm just going try to try to add some names in here. So I'm just going to say a hallway. Um, I'm going to say a cafe. Uh, we'll say a, you know, office one. Keeping it kind of generic here, sorry. Office 2, you know, maybe this is a, a VP office, and this is a, um, you know, we'll say a HR office, um, you know, the IT, we'll say a break room. I don't know how you guys have it in your offices, but in our office, the uh, the break room has always seemed to be right next to the IT room. I don't know if that's the IT guy's doing or, or how it goes, but um, he always seems to get the benefit of that. Not a knock on IT guys, just lucky to get to pick your office, I guess. Let's say president office out here. And then uh, we'll say I've always wanted a corner, corner, corner office, so I'm going to make my office out there. I'm going to go ahead now, and uh, I'm going to add a quick little color legend that just lets me see this a little bit better for my clientele. I'm going to go ahead and grab the legend tool, and I'm going to place that legend on screen. I'm going to say that I want the color scheme to be set up by names, and I'm going to say OK. You'll notice that very quickly I was able to develop a quick little color legend that I'm able to present to my clients if I wanted to. 
Now, let's say I wanted to take it a bit further than that. I, um, uh, you know, they, they wanted to, to really quick have an idea of what the dimensions might look like in this space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and, and just quickly do a schematic dimension uh, dimension plan. Now, you know, we could always do the, the, the typical way that you go about dimensioning something. Um, we, could, we could grab our dimension tool and, you know, we could pick a start point and, um, you know, we could, we could just kind of, you know, arbitrarily go through and, and pick points, right? I mean, uh, that, that method's always worked in AutoCAD and, you know, it could, it could definitely work in this program as well. It didn't take, uh, it didn't take too long, right? A um, little tedious, but, you know, it got the job done. I could do an overall if I wanted to. Got the job done, right? It, you know, it wasn't, wasn't super fast, but was able to, to get the job done. Uh, we also have the ability to, to do it just a bit faster than that. Um, suppose I grab the Align Dimension tool. One of the things that I have whenever you grab a tool is we have what's called an Options Bar, which is located right below the ribbon. And if I look at the options that I have available to me when I create dimensions, one of the options I have is to generate uh, dimensions based on an entire wall. And I can actually go into the options of that, and I can say, for instance, I'm interested in the openings. And for this case, we'll say um, we're interested in center points. <coughs> I'll also go ahead and say I'm interested in intersecting walls, and I'll say OK. Now, now really, at this point, it's just as simple as, as picking my wall, right? You know, I just, just go ahead and pick my wall. And notice that as I pick my wall, it, uh, it goes ahead and, and dimensions it, right? It's... Um, pretty quick and you're not, not too labor intensive and uh, you know, I'm able to get quite a bit of da data and just with a few clicks of the, of the mouse. And if I wanted to um, you know, maybe do some overall dimensions, I could do that very quickly as well just by uh, just changing my options a bit. Just makes it a little less tedious, right? I mean, anything we can do to, to click the mouse a few less times in the day and, and just, and just get, get done with the mundane tasks a little bit faster. So again, just in a few short minutes here, I've got a, um, a, a pretty um, you know, res respectable display here. I've got you know, a, um, a nice room legend to go along with a, um, a dimension plan with um, areas for each one of these spaces. Um, I've also got a, 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 a nice 3D. You know, I've got something that's, that's sort of nice to look at here, um, you know, somewhat creative. Uh, I've also got some elevations that I can take a look at. You notice as I switch between my different elevations. I'm seeing the different elevations that are available on this structure. So very quickly, I've got, um, I've got quite a bit of information that I've gathered from this screen. Uh, let's say we wanted to take it you know, just a little bit further. right? We, we always want to try to press, press just a bit further, see if we can't get just a bit more information out of our projects. right? Uh, let's go ahead and create some sections. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the View tab of the ribbon. And from the View tab of the ribbon, I'm going to select the Section tool. I'm going to pick a, uh, a Start Point and a Stop Point. And what's great about the Section tool is uh, when we select it, we've got some different features available to us. As an example, we can flip the direction of the section. We can use this big toggle box that we have, this uh, sort of a dash blue line. We can use that to toggle the depth of the section. We also have these little recycle symbols and what these allow us to do is actually toggle the, the section head that we see on screen. A question that I get a lot of times is, um, you know, hey, is that section head uh, customizable? Can we make that however we want? The answer is absolutely yes. We can do, we can set that up, you know, however you want it to, to look and feel. And that's also a service that Sterling can provide your team with. Now, if I go ahead and I select that, uh, that section symbol, I'm able to actually right-click and say, Go to View. And when I do that, I'll actually see the section of the building. Now, what's great to remember about Revit is that, um, unlike a lot of the other programs that are out there, is that uh, you know, Revit is not, not just a, a program that works in one view. We're also able to actually edit content in a section. So as an example, if I wanted to move a door, I can move the door right here in a section if I wanted to. I don't have to just wait till I'm in a floor plan view to do that. I'm going to go ahead and move back to that floor plan view. One of the other questions that I get a lot of times is how do I create a split segment? So as an example, 
let's say there was a point in the section that we wanted to maybe uh, toggle um, you know, where the section cut was occurring. I can actually go ahead and hit the split segment tool that I find in the ribbon. And I'm actually able to go ahead and split a section of that, se of that, of that section line. And now when I go ahead and say go to view, I'm able to actually see different portions of the building in this section. I don't know why I'd want to do what I just did, but let's suppose I did it. It, it did the job, obviously. Now, in addition to sections, uh, we also can create what are called callouts. I'm sure you're all familiar with them. Uh, we could create a callout in a floor plan view if we wanted to. Could very quickly go ahead and um, you know pick a start point and a stop point. And these callouts are also customizable. I can adjust where the head goes. I could adjust the toggle on it if I wanted to. A lot of different features that I have available to me. And what's great is that, you know, of course, when I go ahead and I select this uh, callout view that I generated, I can right click and I can say go to view. And notice I get an enlarged version of that, uh, that space. You'll notice that some of the details gone away. Um, that's because the detail that we set up in the previous view is specific to that view. I'd have to recreate some of that data to have it relative here. Uh, but I'm not going to worry about that so much right now. Now I also can create a callout view in a section. So I'm going to go ahead and say uh, go to view. And I'm going to just take a look at one of my walls here. I'm going to go ahead and create a quick little callout of one of my walls. And I'm going to go ahead and say go to view. Now I probably would want this wall section to maybe be at a larger scale. I'm just going to change it to three quarter as an example. Pretty difficult to read at this point, right? I mean, it's not um, not incredibly legible. It's 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 somewhat complicated to to really see. Um, so we might have to make some some adjustments just so that we can view this information a bit better. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create some breaks. And this program is really great for creating these kinds of breaks. What I can do is I can always go ahead and select what's called the crop region of a view. You notice in these crop regions that I have these little break symbols. And if I click those break symbols, what I'm able to do is I'm actually able to go ahead and adjust the view. Now bear with me for just a few seconds here because what I'm going to do is I'm very quickly going to go ahead and create a few different breaks in the project. And what I'm going to do with these breaks is I'm going to create basically a wall section that we can actually go ahead and dissect a little bit. Now notice that as I'm doing this, it's creating some pretty large gaps, right? I mean, we're seeing these uh, pretty, uh, pretty large, wide gaps um, that, that obviously aren't, aren't ideal um, in displaying this kind of information. But what's great about this program is that uh, what I can do is I can actually use an interior toggle feature to actually go ahead and move these pieces a little bit closer together. So notice I can move these sections of wall as close as I might want to move them together. So I can turn a 60 uh, or a 75 foot wall section into a much smaller display very quickly. And by simply turning off my crop region, I could also go back in here and add break lines if I wanted to do that. Now what's really powerful about this tool is that you'll notice right now, um, you know, maybe I need to up the scale just a bit, bit higher. You'll notice right now that it's, it's obviously showing my level lines still at their correct heights. Now even more so than that, if I were to go ahead and create a dimension between two level lines, notice that it maintains that dimension, right? It maintains that that's 15 feet even though I've moved these two objects significantly closer to one another. And regardless of whether or not I move these objects further apart, that dimension of 15 feet remains consistent. Now another big question that comes up a lot of times is, well this is, again, um, it's all well and good, but it, you know, it's, it's still really cartoony. Um, is, there, is there ways for us to, to, to get a little bit more detailed with it? 
And the answer, again, is yes. I, I can't delve into it too deep today, but um, we do have the ability to very easily go ahead and begin, for instance, noting information on screen. We can either use our text tool to obviously go ahead and start notating data on screen. I think my, uh, my crop region is not quite big enough here. I'm going to make it just a bit bigger so we're not running into a dilemma. Um, we also have some keynoting features available to us. So we're able to actually go ahead and do an element keynote if we want to. And what we can do from there is go ahead and specify what we've got. So in this case, I might specify that I have a, uh, a standard brick, by example. And what's great is, you know, once we've, um, in most instances, once we've tagged a material once or an object once, we can continue to tag that um, later throughout the day or later throughout the project. That again here, I'll uh, see if I can uh, tag that material again here. Um, just specify uh, masonry again here, uh, clay unit masonry. So again, we're able to, to very easily go ahead and tag this data into our project. You notice that um, once I've tagged it one time, the program becomes pretty intuitive and it, it starts to realize, okay, I, uh, I'm starting to understand what that might need to be. Um, so it'll start to, to sort of take guesses or um, not so much guesses, but, but definitely re make reinforced decisions to, um, um, to understand what something might be or, or isn't be or, 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 or isn't. Um, so again, I, I'm able to very quickly go ahead and, and start tagging different objects using the keynoting tool. Now, in addition to that, if I wasn't happy necessarily with the representation, I could always use my detail lines tool to obviously draw in, if I wanted to, mortise joints. I don't have to be so untechnical, you know, it doesn't have to be so um, uh, you know, uh, mundane like that. I also can use what's called a, uh, um, a component. Um, or a repetitive detail. And in this example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm just going to draw some brick. So notice that I'm able to very quickly use the, uh, the repetitive detail tool to draw some brick into the project. I've also got uh, insulation tools that allow me to very quickly, for instance, draw insulation into my project. So some really great technical tools that we can use to, you know, make our information read a little bit stronger um, and really carry the weight that it needs to. Now again, this is really just sort of a crash course into the documentation settings that we have available to us. Um, in our uh, introductory Revit architecture class, we delve deep into the construction documentation portion of the Revit architecture interface, which includes the setting up and development of keynotes, developing multi-tags, um, creating custom tags, working a little bit uh, deeper into developing dimensions, um, detailed line work, and all, all the data, data that's in, extremely important in developing a project. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to go ahead and, um, and just talk briefly a little bit more about uh, um, you know, the presentation of this information. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and switch to a site plan. Um, Revit is a really great program when it comes to, to uh, taking a first stab or a first pass at maybe a site plan, uh, but it definitely works much stronger in conjunction with programs like Civil 3D. For those of you guys that aren't familiar with Civil 3D, we do offer services and training in the program. Uh, Chad Studer is our resident expert on Civil 3D, and for those of you guys that haven't met Chad, he's a really great presenter and someone that I definitely encourage you guys to sit down with if you have an opportunity because he definitely understands how the BIM architectural interface could definitely can, uh, can join with the Civil 3D interface. Um, so definitely a, a very important person to speak to and work with if you have an opportunity. And, and definitely uh, I recommend uh, uh, sitting through a presentation of his if you have an opportunity. Uh, but uh, we don't have a point cloud just at the moment. Um, uh, so what we're going to do is you know, we'll make our own mass. We'll make our own site. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the Massing and Site tab. And I'm going to select the topo surface tool. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just place a few points uh, around my structure. Something kind of generic here. Nothing, nothing too crazy. And you know what? I, I, I kind of think I would like to have, um, yeah, I'd like to kind of have a hill of some kind. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm just going to, you know, in the background here, I'm going to add a little topography just so I have a little bit of a, you know, kind of a hill or something to, to kind of to look at as scenery. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and say finish. And I'll switch to a 3D view. And you'll notice very quickly, right, I've, I've developed kind of a generic site to work from. Um, I don't, I'm not too fond of the dirt, the dirt look here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to very quickly change the, uh, the uh, background here to be, um, you know, to be grass as an example. Didn't quite get it there. And uh, I'm also going to go ahead and um, I'm just going to plop some trees in. Um, I'm going to just you know, plop some trees around the project, dress it up a little bit, uh, make it look a little bit uh, snazzy. Um, just try to get, get some more data on screen here just so it's uh, really reading the way I, I want it to. You know, I'll throw a couple different trees in here so I don't you know, just have a bunch of the same. Now the program um, definitely doesn't doesn't replace a program like, for instance, 3D Studio Max. It actually works very strongly and um, uh, has a very good partnership with the Max software. Uh, but um, when we're doing initial schematics, the program is very helpful in developing, for instance, preliminary renderings or maybe a, you know just a quick little one-pass image of what you might want the uh, the structure to look like. So as an example, I'm going to switch back to my site plan, and I'm going to very quickly go ahead and generate what we call a 3D camera view. And what I'm going to do with this 3D camera view is I'm going to pick a start point from the view, and I'm going to pick a focus point. And you'll notice that very quickly I'm able to develop kind of a you know, generic view of my structure. Now I have different representations available to me when I view this. You know, down in my display options, I could view it in a wireframe if I wanted to. I could view it in a hidden line setting. I'm able to go ahead and turn to a shaded, so it's sort of that colored representation. I can go to consistent colors, which sort of takes those shadow settings out of it and makes everything very consistent in its display. Or I could go to more of a realistic display. And for those of you that are familiar with SketchUp or 3ds Max, very similar in the display settings and how it reads on screen. Now in addition to that, I'm able to go ahead and turn things on like shadows. So I'm able to really sort of see the way the shadows interact with the space. And I also can generate a rendering. So as an example, if I wanted to see this in a little bit, you know, uh, nicer display, I could go ahead and say that I want this in a, I'm going to say medium just so we don't take too much time. We'll say it's an exterior sun rendering, and I'm going to go ahead and hit render. Now, the Revit program, again, as I said a few moments ago, certainly doesn't replace programs like, for instance, 3DS Max or Maya or some of the other rendering programs that we have out there. But it definitely gives you a pretty good representation of what your structure may look like in the initial display. We also do offer training in 3DS Max. And we offer a specific training that actually allows you to link Revit data into 3ds Max, which is a really powerful tool that allows you to work, obviously, in both directions. So your staff could be, obviously, working in Revit while rendering that data out in 3ds Max. For those of you that haven't been exposed to it, uh, Autodesk has most recently released a new application or a new uh, product suite called the Building Design Premium Suite which also includes the Revit architecture as well as the 3ds Max suite. They all kind of come together in a binded package. For those of you guys looking to upgrade your software package, it's definitely a direction I would look in just to try to give yourself a little bit more functionality in using programs and um, using you know, uh, cool techniques such as 3D renderings. Again, you'll notice that this is not the highest quality. There's a lot higher settings that I can work with. And actually, in our uh, advanced class that we teach here at Sterling Systems, we discuss how we get into detailed renderings 
and how we really make these images pop um, and, and coordinate uh, a little bit nicer than what we see on screen right here. Now to get back into the documentation as we try to kind of close the session out here, um, as we try to get back into the, uh, the discussion of, uh, of documentation, one last little tool that I want to talk about is schedules. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to stay uh, uh, kind of on the view tab here, but I'm going to switch to a floor plan. Now from my floor plan view, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I am going to, um, I am going to go ahead and uh, turn my schedule tool on. And I'm going to say that I want to create schedules and quantities. And from here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that I want to create a door schedule. And I'm going to say OK. Now, creating a schedule is as simple as selecting parameters that you want to schedule by. So as an example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start by saying that I want to schedule by the mark. From there, I'm going to go ahead and say that I want to schedule by the family and type. Something like, for instance, uh, height and width might be important. So I'm going to go ahead and add those factors in as well. You'll notice that I could also add things like, for instance, uh, you know, I could add um, features like cost. I could add things like, for instance, uh, the level that that's located on. Um, you know, I could add the rough height, the rough width, you name it. There's a lot of different parameters that you can add into these projects. You're also able to create your own parameters. And you could do that by either creating an add parameter into the project, or you can actually generate shared parameters within your door families, something we'll talk about briefly next Wednesday in our family creation discussion. Now, once you have all your parameters in place, um, we're able to go ahead and very quickly go at, uh, very quickly develop um, uh, a schedule that we might want to see on screen. You notice that I very quickly developed this door schedule. I've also categorized it by the specific level that those particular doors reside on. Now again, a powerful tool is that these schedules actually correlate to objects in the model. So as an example, if I were to open up that level one again and split screen between, for instance, my floor plan and my door schedule, if I select a door over here in my schedule, you should notice that it actually selects the door over here in the floor plan. So as an example, if I decided that I wanted to change a door family to, let's say, a, a single glass, I could do that in the schedule and it would change it over here on the project or in my uh, view. And you'll notice that those changes are occurring instantly. There's no lag. There's no hitting a regen button. They just immediately occur. Those updates immediately change. Now let's go ahead and just sheet some of the information that we've developed. I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and create a new sheet. So I've got my new sheet on screen here. You'll notice that there's some information available to me down here at the bottom of my screen. On the Manage tab of the ribbon, we have a really great feature called Project Information. And what Project Information allows us to do is fill out pertinent data that relates directly to our sheets. So as an example, if I wanted to know, if I wanted to specify the owner, of this particular project. I could go ahead and do that. I could specify different information that's relative to the project that I'm working on. And I could also go ahead and have that information prompt itself into the actual project. Now, I don't have to just necessarily be in the, the in project information to do this. I could go ahead and say, uh, do it right from, uh, um, uh, I could do it right from uh, uh, the actual sheet. I don't have to go back and forth. I can um, do it right here. So I can do that very quickly. 
Now, in order to go ahead and start populating this sheet with actual uh, information, all I need to do is go ahead and start dragging a view onto screen. Just drag those views onto screen. And once the view's on screen, I might want to make certain adjustments to it. And I'm able to actually activate those views. And for instance, reduce the size of, let's say, the crop region. So I don't have to see things like, for instance, my elevation markers. So very quickly, I'm able to go ahead and generate a quick little sheet using all those generic views that we developed. Let's go ahead and just plop a couple more on here. Let's grab that, uh, that building section that we did. Able to get that on there. Let's put our uh, our wall section on here. Able to get that on there pretty nicely. And if I wanted to, I could even um, uh, I even could put that that rendering that we did on here. Let's go back and take a look at that guy for just a second. Um, Oh, you know what, I uh, I think that I um, forgot to save that rendering when we did that to render. Now, you know, we'll, uh, we'll cancel that rendering here just for a second so we don't have to sit through that. And what we'll do is we'll just put a, um, we'll just go ahead and put uh, <clears throat> that, that 3D view on here instead just to save some time as we, uh, start to run out here at the end of the, uh, the presentation. So I'll just, I'll throw that, that 3D representation on. And if I wanted to, I could, um, you know, I could uh, select that view and, um, you know, we could uh, adjust the size of it. You know, maybe we want this to be um, 10 inches. Just so it's, uh, Filling that space up there a bit better. And maybe just to round it out, we, um, we throw that uh, door schedule on here, right? Maybe we, we plop that right here. We'll grab the uh, schedules, door schedule. And I could, um, could plop that sucker on there. Just get rid of that guy for a second here and we'll move that up. And I can very easily um, make adjustments just to shrink that up a bit. Now it might be a little bit easier to get that uh, 3D view that we did on here. So in just about a, uh, about an hour, we were able to build a, uh, you know, a pretty generic structure. No, uh, I'll leave it that. A pretty generic structure, we were able to build that. Uh, but we were also able to go ahead and in that same time, um, obviously develop a, um, you know, a complicated uh, um, set of sections, um, you know, a detailed uh, um, drawing with some keynotes on it, as well as a, a detailed schedule and sheet it all. Um, so, so pretty quick to, to develop those, those introductory uh, segments. Again, this is just an introduction to Revit architecture. So we really haven't even scratched the surface of all the nuts and bolts that, that really reside in each one of those components we discuss. Um, there are definitely features that we still need to cover and things that I would want to spend quite a bit more time discussing. But all in all, there are some great opportunities in working with this program. And we can develop really technical documentation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just pull up a quick little model for you guys just so you can see some of the capabilities that are available to you in the software. Uh, we don't have to do just simple, simple, uncomplicated structures. We can get very technical in our presentations um, and very technical in the documentation we create uh, just by simply developing um, you know, more complicated models. Uh, the one that I'm going to open here very shortly, um, a very uh, uh, large-scale hospital structure 
um, that, that, that I worked on um, that I think would uh, sort of speak to the level of detail that really can be put into a, uh, a structure um, uh, that might be a little bit more common to the work that you and your office do. Um, while this loads, again, I just want to thank everyone for participating today. Um, if I could, uh, just uh, uh, just to, to recap a, uh, a couple of things. Uh, again, uh, February 16th, if you can mark it in your calendars, Lynn Allen, uh, Autodesk uh, representative, will be in town. A really, really great speaker, um, well-respected in the industry. And again, uh, she knows pretty much all there is to know about Autodesk, AutoCAD, and all things that are, uh, that are BIM in the world um, uh, currently. So definitely a great person to, uh, uh, to, sit, to, have, a, to have an opportunity to see speak. Um, doesn't come here, come here very often, so a really great opportunity for her to, to, to be available to us. Also, again, uh, uh, for those of you that didn't, uh, weren't able to, to jot it down, uh, Brandon Taylor is the account manager for the uh, AEC uh, side of our business. Um, also, Dave Press, uh, for those of you guys that are working with him. Um, so uh, if, you, if you weren't able to jot that number down, it's right there on the screen, 1-480-629-8131. You're welcome to contact myself or Chad Studer, who's the Vice President of our Services Division, uh, through that line. Um, if you are not signed up for it, I ple please I encourage you to join us on Wednesday, January 11th, from 2 to 3.30, for our Part 2 Intro to Family Creation demonstration, where I'm going to be displaying how we actually go ahead and create families. Um, for those of you that have never built a family before, really great opportunity to see how it's done. Um, and maybe get you know, some interest in taking one of our family creation courses. On January 16th, I'll be doing the part three portion of this uh, four-part mini-series. We'll be talking about how we can edit current families that we have in our libraries or edit content that we pull from websites like Revit City. Uh, finally, on Wednesday, January 25th, I'll be doing a top 10 tips and tricks demonstration where I'll talk about all the top 10 features that are available to us to us. Um, these are items that are on Augie's uh, top 10 list every year uh, that, that, that would be very uh, crucial or at least uh, uh, worth understanding in using the program. Just to go back to, uh, to Revit real quick, I'll, I'll, again I'll show you uh, just a little bit more complicated project um, just to see some of the capabilities that the program has out there and uh, just to, to see that, that we can get a, a bit more technical um, uh, than, than the generic model that you saw me present just a few moments ago. I'm going to go ahead and look at the question board here. I don't know that I have any uh, uh, questions or chat items that were listed on here. Um, I did uh, have a couple people, or at least one person, say they lost audio. Hopefully they were able to get that back. Um, not sure. Uh, but I'm not seeing any, uh, any, any huge posts. Uh, I'm going to be on here for just a few minutes uh, after the presentation. So don't hesitate to, uh, to throw a question up then. Uh, again, um, uh, just looking on screen here, uh, taking a bit longer to boot. The file was, was quite large, but uh, there is a hospital up on screen that's prompting. But that does conclude the presentation. Again, here is a, you know, a bit more complicated of a structure for those of you guys that are interested in just seeing something a bit more technical. Um, again, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to be with us here today. Again, my name is Brandon LaCourcier with Sterling Systems. It's been an absolute pleasure, pleasure uh, working with you guys today, and I hope to meet with each and every one of you in the near future. Uh, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'm going to pull the, the, mute, the mute button off um, and uh, I'll let everyone uh, throw some Q&A out here for the next few minutes. Um, uh, again, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to meet with you guys. Thank you. I believe the mute button is off for everyone. If you have any questions, just go right ahead and, uh, and chime in. Yeah.